We have Gushers LLC is owned equally by Gushing Grape, Strawberry Splash, and Watermelon Blast. Those are actually Gusher flavors. On January 1st of this year, Gushing Grape's outside basis is $170, and the LLC's balance sheet is as follows. So we got a bunch of different assets, cash, accounts receivable, stock, inventory, land number one, land number two, and we're assuming that stock is a capital asset as we normally assume. Also, we have liabilities. That's very important to understand is that there are liabilities in this problem. And then the capital accounts, of course, for Gushing Grape, Strawberry Splash, and Watermelon Blast. We can abbreviate the owners G, S, and W for this problem to make it simple. On January 1st of this year, Gushing Grape, which again is G, receives the following alternative distributions in complete liquidation of her interest in the LLC. What are the tax consequences to Gushers LLC and each owner as a result of these distributions? So we have A, B, C, D, E. E has the original E, E1 and E2, and then F, which is the original F, F1 and F2. We have to go through all these different alternative situations. Now, we know this is a distribution problem. So we go ahead and we note that. We have, we have distributions here, which that's a big difference from the sales rules. Also, it's important to note that in each situation, Gushing Grape is, a comp is liquidating completely his or her interest in this LLC. That's very important to understand. It's a complete liquidation. All right. So as we saw in problem one, the first place that we start is we ask, is the distribution, is it pro rata or disproportionate? Because that makes a big difference. Disproportionate involves section 751B, and we have a special analysis we do with respect to disproportionate distributions. Now, the video is part of the pro rata distribution sets, so you're thinking, oh, well, I know it's pro rata already. Unfortunately, though, some teachers out there aren't as nice as I am, or they might, they might not tell you, and I might actually give a problem where I don't tell you as well, and you just understand. The way we know something is a pro rata versus disproportionate distribution is we ask, does the partner have the same amount of hot assets before versus after? And we focus on the fair market value of those hot assets. Now, under Section 751B through 751C and D, the hot assets are really the ordinary income assets, like accounts receivable, which is unrealized receivable, Section 1245 property, Section 1250 property. Also, not all inventory, but substantially appreciate inventory. Substantially appreciate inventory is when you have 120% of adjusted basis if the fair market value is greater than that amount. If the fair market value is greater than 120% of basis, the adjusted basis of that inventory is considered substantially appreciated. With respect to our facts, cash is not considered a hot asset under 751B. Accounts receivable is a hot asset. Stock. Stock, since it's capital asset here, again, we're assuming it's uh, considered capital asset investment, not a hot asset, it's a cold asset. Inventory. So we have our substantially appreciated inventory or substantially appreciated inventory rule. The rule again is if the fair market value is greater than 120% of adjusted basis, it's considered a hot asset. So the fair market value here is 60. Is that greater than 1.2 of 30, which equals 36? Is 60 greater than 36? Yes. So this is a hot asset. Now, land one and land two, we're going to assume that the land is either a 1231 asset or a capital asset for this analysis. It makes no difference with respect to what's going on to the, to the partners. It makes no difference there. It's considered a cold asset either way. All right. So each owner owns equally the business before Gushing Grape leaves. So everything is one-third. That means that one-third of the accounts receivable gain, I'm sorry, one-third of the accounts receivable fair market value, right? 30 times one-third. I said gain, but really the, 
the gain and the fair market value here are equal. It's the fair market value is 10. And then the inventory is 60 times one third, 20. So if we join these two numbers together before this transaction, each owner, Gushing Grape, Strawberry Splash, and Watermelon Blast has $30 fair market value of hot assets. 10 of accounts receivable and 20 of inventory. So when Gushing Grape leaves the partnership, leaves the LLC, Gushing Grape needs to receive $30 of hot assets. Whether it's accounts receivable and inventory makes no difference. As long as Gushing Grape is receiving $30 of hot assets, it's considered a pro rad distribution. So let's just test each of these. So in A, Gushing Grape receives the account receivable and land one. The account receivable, we focus on fair market value, is equal to 30, the entire 30. And hey, that's equals 30. So look at that. 30 equals 30, right? 30 before, 30 after, right? It's what you have before and after. After, there's no ownership in the partnership, so you have to be receiving 30 of, the, of whatever hot assets, account receivable inventory. $30 total of, uh, when you sum those together. B is also 30 before, 30 after. C is one half the inventory and land one. Well, inventory is 60, right? Bef for all these before, is going to be 30. But after, inventory is 60. 60 times one half is 30. Look at that. 30 equals 30. And D, one third of both inventory and accounts receivable and land two. So that's going to be one third, one third, because that's exactly what we have, right? One third of the inventory, one third of accounts receivable. E, the accounts receivable, which is 30, and one half of land one and two. So again, 30 equals 30. F, one third of both inventory and accounts receivable, and 120 cash. So 30 equals 30. So in each of these situations, they're equal. 30 equals 30. So before the hot asset amount using fair market value is 30. That's what gushing grapes percentage is. After is also 30. This, these are all considered pro rad distributions. Because they're pro rad distributions, we do not have to worry about 751B and that hypothetical analysis, 47 analysis. We will see a problem later on when we go through the 47 analysis. But you still have to remember the pro rata rules that we apply the chart when doing that as well. All right. So now we can jump into this pro rata discussion of distributions. Now, one thing to note, once you determine whether something is pro rata versus disproportionate, the next question, if it's pro rata, right? So pro rata versus disproportionate. It's not disproportionate, it's pro rata. The next question is, is it liquidating or is it non-liquidating? Well, we're told in the problem, Russian grape is completely being relinquished of the partnership interest or the LLC interest. We need to keep that in mind when we're going through our distribution rules. Let's go ahead and create a chart. We've got all these different situations. We've got A, B, C, D, E, E1, E2, F, F1, and F2. Now remember, with respect to all of these, we're focusing on gushing grape, and gushing grape is getting different items in each case. So we're going through and determining the consequences. We're, at, we're looking at two things. Now because it's a pro rad distribution, remember that under section 731, the partnership, the LLC, no consequences. Now, if it's disproportionate, different. So under section 731, LLC has no gain or loss recognized. Now, with respect to the partner, Gushing Grape, that depends. That depends on what's going on. Let's go back to our chart. So in problem one for pro rata distributions, we focus on these charts, and we're going to look at the same stuff. So remember, we've got some simple rules when it comes to distributions or rules for simple distributions, which again are pro rata. First thing is no gain or loss to the partnership, which we just saw. Gain only to the partner if you receive cash and it exceeds the outside basis. 
loss to the partner, distributed partner, only if it's liquidating distribution with no tier three assets. Well, we do have a liquidating distribution here, so that is possible. So keep that in mind, that we could have a loss in the situation. It would be a capital loss, by the way, if it's going to be a loss. Now, in addition to those rules, we have our three-tier system. Tier one is cash. So if we receive any cash, we take our outside basis first to cash. Second, tier two is ordinary income assets. Tier three is other, everything else other than ordinary income assets. Now, ordinary income assets include all inventory. So even if you didn't have substantially appreciated inventory under 751B, it'd be all inventory there because, as we know, inventory is going to create ordinary income assets. So looking at things here in this problem, it's going to be the inventory and the accounts receivable. Those are going to be the ordinary income assets. And other is going to be everything else, the stock, the land that's in the problem, if received by Gush and Grape. Now note that cash is always the same whether it's liquidating or non-liquidating. You just simply go through. If you have enough basis, you reduce the basis, you go to the next level. Tier 2, you carry out the inside basis limited to outside basis. Tier 3, if it's liquidating, and this is different than we saw in problem one, which was a non-liquidating distribution, right? you had a ownership afterwards, the distributed assets, they take the remaining outside basis. So whatever's left over, they get. And the reason why that rule is the case is because there's no partnership interest to allocate to. Now, if it's liquidating and there's no tier three assets, you're going to have a capital loss, and that's where we have the capital loss. It's the only time you're going to have a loss. So gain is only comes into play in tier one. Loss can only come into play in tier three if there's no tier three assets. All right, so with those rules in mind, let's go, let's go jump into our analysis. So I've already set up kind of our, our grouping. So again, 731 is where we find the potential for gain or loss to the partners. And we saw those specific situations. Now, 732... Anytime that we're determining the basis of an asset receipt, whether it's inventory, land, stock, invent, uh, accounts receivable, 732 gives the, uh, determines the basis of the distributee. That's what we use the chart for, to determine that amount. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's under 732. That's the adjusted basis in the property received by the distributee, which we're going through all these different alternatives, and we're going to see different types of property. So we have our little list here. We start always with the outside basis. We reduce for tier one assets, or tier one assets. Then we go into tier two. In tier two here, it's going to be again if we have an, if uh, gushing grape receives any inventory or accounts receivable. Finally, tier three, tier three assets. Potentially, there's land one, land two, and the stock. So we can see that as well. So we'll keep that in mind. And there's no, nothing beyond tier three because it's a liquidating partnership interest. There is no outside basis, no partnership interest here because it's liquidating. That's a big difference from problem one, the pro-rad distribution problem one. And that's why the rules are, are different as well. So keep that in mind. Let's start with A. So in A, Gush and Grape is going to completely liquidate and going to receive... Accounts receivable, the entire amount of accounts receivable, and land one. Now, one thing to note, some people will look at this problem, they would jump right to, okay, we have no tier one, go right to tier two. We got to be careful though. Liability relief. Under the tax law, liability relief for purposes of the distribution and the regs in 731, they treat liability relief as cash as a tier one asset. So the liabilities at the time Gush and Grape leaves are 150. Gush and Grape is a one third owner. As we know under 752 liability allocation, if you don't know, you can see my problems on that and my discussion on that and other videos. That means that Gush and Grape before leaving was deemed to own 50 or be responsible for 50 liability after is zero. That's $50 of liability relief. That $50 of liability relief is considered cash. So that liability relief, I'm going to put another line here. Let's go ahead and we're going to erase, we're going to move the outside basis up one. I'm going to make liability relief its own line. 
So outside adjusted base is what we start with. Liability relief. Because in parts of the problem, we're going to receive both. So I'm going to keep that in mind. So in all of these, the outside base is the gushing grape is 170. So we can put that up top in all of these situations. All these situations, we start with 170. Also, in all these situations, gushing grape is going to have 50 of liability relief. So we can go ahead and subtract away 50. Now, again, in some situations, gushing grape will also receive cash, direct cash, not indirect cash like liability relief. So you're going to have a second line there. A, B, C, D, and E. That's right. Gushing grape does not receive cash. It's only when you get to F where gushing grape receives cash. So that means that this step, we can go ahead for sake of time, we can bring down a subtotal of 120 here, 120, until we get to F. In F, grape's gonna receive, gushing grape's going to receive some cash, so we have to add something in there. And because none of these are negative, there's not going to be any gain to gushing grape in A, B, C, D, E, E1, E2. The subtotal comes down to 120. And now we get to the good stuff. So here are the assets. I mean, after we consider that liability relief, and remember, you got to pay attention to that. So if you got a problem on exam, you see liabilities, and then partnership partners leaving, and there's liabilities, you better believe they're going to have liability relief, and that goes into that cash element. Now we got accounts receivable in land one. So we go to tier two, the accounts receivable is considered a tier two asset because it's a hot ass, it's an ordinary income asset. It's also a hot asset for 751B, but again, this is a pro rata. So the rule is, going back to our rules, tier two, carry out the inside basis, limited to the outside basis. So it's the lesser of the inside basis the partnership has, which is zero. Or the outside basis at the, after tier 1 is considered, which is 120, so that's going to be 0. We bring down our subtotal, 120. Now, we've just determined the 732 basis of the accounts receivable. So, gushing grape takes a basis in the accounts receivable received of 0. That's what we're determining there. And that's what we're doing in all of these respective assets. But we also have to subtract away because, remember, it reduces the basis left for the other items. Now, there's another item that Gush and Grape receives, and that's land one. So land one is a tier three asset. That's what's ever left over. And the rule is, for tier three, if it's non-liquidating, same as tier two, but it's a liquidating. If liquidating, distributed assets take outside basis. So it's saying, hey, whatever basis you have left over, that amount goes directly to that asset. Even if you have a billion dollars and the fair market value of the land is 100. You take a billion. The idea is that those assets are not ordinary income. So if the, the taxpayer was to sell it the next day, they wouldn't be able to generate an ordinary loss. So we're putting all that loss into a capital asset or a 1231 asset, which is going to retain the character. And guess what? It's going to become, it's going to keep that character going forward. So as we know, capital losses are very much limited. That's the idea. So that is A. So again, to recap, Gush and Grape has no gain. There's no loss either because there was a Tier 3 asset. Remember, you can only have loss if there's no Tier 3 assets. And the basis of the account receivable under 732 is 0, and the basis of the land is 120. Sorry, I jumped the gun earlier. We're going to see in the problem later on, uh, E1 and E2, that our basis is going to change. So we actually... Also, it's F1 and F2 as well. So the facts will tell us that um, those bases will change. So E1, E2, basis changes. F1, F2, basis changes as well. And then we can go ahead and we can, for E1 and E2, we can take out this amount right here because the base is going to change. We'll, we'll put the bases in when we get to that part of the problem. Sorry about that. I jumped the gun. Got real excited to jump into those. All right. So now we go to B. So B 
is just like A. Accounts receivable, but now we have land two. So we're down. It's the same thing for accounts receivable. It's the lesser of zero basis, inside basis, or the fair market value, which of course is zero. So we take the zero. Then we come down to 120, and now we get land two instead of land one, and the basis is going to be 120. Now look, if you look at the balance sheet, they have the same fair market values, but they have different bases. Notice that land one has a basis of 180, and land two has a basis of 90. But from a tax standpoint, if you are gushing grape, do you care whether you get land one or land two? Does it make a difference? No, it doesn't. Not for gushing grape. Because you're going to take a 120 basis regardless. But what about Strawberry Splash, Watermelon Blast, the remaining owners? Do they care? Yes. Which, which of the two pieces of land would they rather give up in that situation? They'd rather give up land two, exactly. And the reason why they want to keep land one is as a built-in loss. You're losing that $60, that 180 to 120 difference. That's going to get lost. When it goes to gushing grape, that $60 just disappears. Boom, gone. So this is where you start getting into issues where when somebody wants a distribution or leaves, you got to bring their attorneys to the table and each of them have to have their own attorneys or at least one attorney representing the partnership and one for Gush and Grape. Gush and Grape doesn't care. But Gush and Grape, if they have a good attorney, Gush and Grape knows this and says, hey, if I take land one, you got to give me some of that, that benefit from the loss. Maybe give me an extra $5. Because once land one goes to Gush and Grape, that $60 of built-in loss disappears. It's gone. Because nobody gets the benefit at that point. But if, if Gushing Grape gets land two, which is a 90 basis, different story, right? That 180 basis is still there for the other two partners to take advantage of. Okay, so now we go to C. C is one half of inventory and land number one. All right, so again, we go right down to the tier two assets. Now we have inventory. Remember, the rule is for tier two, whether it's liquidating or non liquidating, you're limited to inside basis or outside basis, the lesser of those. So we focus on the basis number. We're going to take whatever amount Gush and Grape gets, right? We take the 30 inside basis, but Gush and Grape's getting one half of that. So that equals 15. So it's the lesser of 15 or the 120 outside basis after tier one. So of course, that's going to be the 15, and that is the basis that Gush and Grape takes in the inventory, and that brings our basis down to 105. And of course, we're getting a tier three asset, land number one. Land number one is all that's left, and that's tier three. So all 105 goes to land one as the basis. And there's no gain or loss on the transaction because we have a tier three asset, so there's no loss, and there's no gain because we have enough uh, basis for the cash, for the tier one assets. All right, so now we go to D. One third of both the inventory and accounts receivable and land number two. All right, so we jump down to tier two. We've got accounts receivable and inventory now. Again, it's one third of both. The accounts receivable... It's always going to be limited to zero because that's what the basis is. The partnership has is zero. Lesser of zero or 120 is zero. Lesser of zero and anything is zero. You can't have negative here. You can't have negative basis. It doesn't exist in tax. So in D, we're going to take a zero basis here in the account receivable. And then one third of the inventory, 30 times one third is 10. The lesser of 10 and 120 is 10. So we do 10 for the inventory for the basis taken. And we bring down a 110 basis left. And then land number two is what's received. That goes down to 110. There's no gain or loss in the transaction for the reasons we saw before. And you have your bases for each asset. Zero for accounts receivable, 10 for inventory, and 110 for land number two. Okay, now we go to E. So E is where things get a little interesting. We've got some special rules to apply in E. So in E, 
We get the entire account receivable and one half of the interest in land one and land two. All right. So we go down to tier two. We're getting the account receivable, all the account receivable. Again, it's limited to the zero rule or lesser of zero 120. So we bring down the 120. Okay. So now we go to tier three. So generally for tier three, the rule is you take whatever basis is left over. If liquidating, distributed assets take outside basis. But we have two assets here. So the issue is, well, how do you break up this 120 between land one and land two? So as I mentioned earlier, we have some special rules we need to apply. So we're looking at E, and again, we're receiving land one and land two. Now look at land one and land two. We're going to need these numbers for adjusted basis and fair market value for the different alternatives. So land one, we're told in the problem, has an adjusted basis of 180. Land two has an adjusted basis of 90. Fair market value of land one, we're told, is 120. And land two is also 120. Now, in all three alternatives, situation E, E1, and E2, Gushing Grape is receiving one half of land one and land two. So we're going to take 180 times one half for adjusted basis. That gives us 90. We're going to take 90 times one half. That gives us 45. For fair market value, we're also going to take one half. We're going to need this for our various analyses. That's going to equal 60 for both. All right. So... We're, again, we're dealing with E here, just the original E. We've already gone through and allocated the account receivable. Remember, we're starting with our basis of 170. We've gone through, we've gone through uh, tier one, tier two. After tier two, assigning uh, zero basis to account receivable, we got 120 left. Now, here's the issue. We have one half of land one and one half of land two. We have 120 basis. If we were to add up the adjusted basis, of one half of the land, the inside basis, which is the 90 and 45 we calculate, we get 135. So looking at our rules and our table, we go down, we get to tier three. Now normally in this, in this part of the problem, so far in A, B, C, and D, when we got to tier three, we saw, hey, if it's liquidating, whatever's left over, it goes to the remaining tier three asset. But now we have an issue, what happens if you have more than one asset? If you have more than one asset, you have to look at various facts. So first thing you ask, how much adjusted basis is left over? What is the adjusted basis after you've allocated tier two? If the adjusted basis left is less than the inside adjusted basis of the assets, here, we see, okay, we have 135, right? So this is saying, okay, we have 120 left after tier two, left to allocate the tier three assets. If that's less than the inside adjusted basis summed together, which here is 135, then we're going to apply some specific rules. If the adjusted basis is that's left over after tier two is more than the inside adjusted basis, we have a different set of rules. So we're dealing with this situation here. The adjusted basis left after tier two to allocate to tier three. When you have multiple assets, right? This is the multiple asset issue. Multiple tier three assets. There's special rules that you apply. And by the way, these rules are found in section 732C2 and C3, how we allocate here. Very, very important. Very important. Okay, so the situation here is 120. Again, that's less than 135. Again, where do we get those numbers? Just to reiterate, the 120 left after we've allocated our 170 basis all the way down past tier two. So we have 120 left to allocate to tier three assets. And then where we get the 135, we add it up. Hey, remember that Gush and Grape is getting one half of land one, one half of land two. So we took one half of the inside basis of the partnership, right? That's the numbers that came from our balance sheet. Multiply that by one half, add it up, we get 135. So the rule, when the adjusted basis left is less than the inside adjusted basis, like we have here, we are going to 
subtract from the depreciated asset. So the idea here is that if your adjusted basis is less than, that's left over, is less than the inside basis, then generally speaking, you probably are going to have some type of asset, not always, but you look for the asset where there's a depreciated asset from the depreciated asset. What do I mean by depreciated assets? Let's look at our assets, looking back at the balance sheet. So we go back to the balance sheet. We have two assets, land one and land two. Land one had a, has a basis of, a 120, of 180 and a fair market value of 120. Land two has a basis of 90 and a fair market value of 120. If you look at these assets, picture it. In your mind, think like this. Let's say the partnership bought these assets three years ago. It bought land one for $180. It's now worth 120. It bought land two three years ago for 90. It's now worth 120. So land one has gone down in value. It's depreciated in value and land two has gone up in value. So the rule is when you don't have enough basis to allocate, right, to all the assets based on the inside basis rule, you subtract away from the depreciated asset. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that 135 we just calculated. We're going to subtract away the 120 we just calculated. The 120 that's left, sorry. The 120 left over. And that gives us 15. That 15 is then going to be subtracted from the depreciated asset. The depreciated asset here, looking back at our assets, we just analyzed. That's land one, right? The depreciated asset is land one. So we're going to take the basis of land one, which in this problem, we calculate that as 90. As 90. We're going to take the 90 basis in land one. So bring that down. The land one basis, right? Land number one, that's the depreciated value or depreciated base um, asset. We're going to subtract that by the difference, the 15. Now, you're not allowed to go below fair market value. So if you go below that 60, you have an issue. So you're limited by the 60 amount, the fair market value. You cannot go below the 60. So 90 minus 15 is 75. We are not below 60, so we are good. So that means that our basis in this situation, in land one is going to be the 75 we just calculated, and land two is going to be the 45. So 75 for land one. That's where we get the basis for land one. For land two, it's the 45, what we originally calculated. And that gives us, if you add those two numbers together, 120. All right, so now we're going to e, E1. And in E1, what's changing now is that the adjusted basis is now 148. So the outside basis starts at 148. We have liability relief of 50, so that's our tier one. That brings down a subtotal of 98. It's positive, so we go down. Again, account receivable is zero because we're getting all the accounts receivable. And remember, we're limited by the lesser of rule, the lesser of inside basis and the outside basis of 98. So we take zero, we have 98 left over. Okay, so we go back to our rules. I'm going to change the color now. Let's use red. First thing, we look at the adjusted basis. The adjusted basis left is 98. The inside basis of the assets that we calculated is 135. Still the same calculation. Still that same 135. So the adjusted basis left is less than the inside basis, so we're still under these rules. So we subtract from the depreciated asset, but remember, we're limited by fair market value. So we're going to go to land one, because remember, land one is the depreciated asset. Remember, we saw that earlier, just like we saw in the original E. So in the original E, remember, we take... The land one basis, land number one, actually let me give myself some more, more space there. So we take land number one, which the adjusted basis we start with is 90. And the difference here, if we recalculate this, let me erase some stuff, right? If we're recalculating, we have the 135 basis starting with minus 98, 135 minus 98, that equals 37. So if we take 90 minus 37, we go down 
to 53. Uh Uh-oh, we're limited by 60. So that means that this can only go down by 30 to 60. What about that? What about the remaining seven? Because again, we're limited to only 98 to allocate in tier three. So next, the next rule is that the next seven or the next amount is allocated based on relative adjusted basis after you've subtracted away the amount to get down to the fair market value limit. So we're limited by the fair market value of of land number one. Okay, so that's $7, right? Because remember, we've just allocated 30. We're supposed to do 37. So we bring that over, 37 minus 30. We have seven left to allocate. So that's based on relative basis. So now our basis in land one after this step right here is 60. In land number two, we've calculated that already. That is 45. So if we add those two together, we get 105. So 60 over 105. And 45 over 105 times 7. If you do this calculation, this equals 4 and this equals 3. So then what we do is we subtract those numbers. 4 from land 1 and 3 from land 2. So we're going to get... 60 minus 4 is 56 for land 1. And then 45 minus 3 is 42 for land 2. So 56 and 42 is what we calculate there. So we go ahead, we put 56 and 42, and that equals 98. So that is how we allocate that 98. So that's E1. So now let's go to E2. I'm going to change the color now to blue. Change it up so... If you see any red analysis, that's our analysis from E1. Blue is going to be analysis from E2. So in E2, we're told what if grapes basis prior to distribution were 210. So if you put 210 here in E2, minus 50 for the liability relief in Tier 1, that brings us down to 160. So it's not, po- it's not a negative number, so it's not gain. So no gain to grape. No gains to partnership. We bring down the 160. Grapes receiving accounts receivable on one half of the pieces of land. So again, the zero rule applies. Lesser of zero, 160. Of course, is zero. So we bring down 160. All right, so now we go over here to our rules. The adjusted basis left is 160. The inside basis, we calculate that already of the assets. That's still 135. So now the question is, what happens if the adjusted basis is greater than the inside basis of 135? Okay. So now, I'm going to draw a little line here to give us some separation. I know it's starting to get messy, right? A lot of times in tax, it does get messy. All right. So now we're exceeding. We have more basis than that left over to allocate to these tier three assets. Because remember, think about what's going on here. Just to re- refresh ourselves in E, E1, and E2. What we saw earlier in A, B, C, and D is we had basis left after tier two. We had one tier at tier three asset, we gave all the rest to that asset. That's what that rule establishes. But now we have two assets and the que- and they're both tier three assets. So the question is, how do you allocate that? I'm showing you the special rules that we use. Again, if the adjusted basis is left is less than the inside basis, you apply the rules that we saw in E and E1. If the adjusted basis is greater than the inside basis calculated, like here, right, 160 is what we have left after tier two. But if we calculate the inside basis, one half, one half of land one and land two adds up to 135. This is what we do, okay? So remember, our fair market values are 60 and 60, and our adjusted basis, adjusted bases are 90 and 45. All right, so what we're going to do is, We've got 160 total basis left after tier two, left to allocate to tier three. So after tier two, we have 160 left. The idea in tax is that that number needs to be allocated to the basis. It can't be changed. You can't, and and as a taxpayer, you don't want to lose it. You want to get it. Minus the adjusted basis, the inside adjusted basis of of land one and land two, which added together, remember, because we're getting one half, is 135. That gives us 25. So 25 needs to be added 
to the bases of the assets. So the starting point, we start with the inside basis of each asset, just like we did before in E and E1. We start with those numbers. We start with 90 and 45. What we do first is the asset that has appreciated in, so the first rule is the appreciated asset. We're going to increase that asset's basis up to fair market value. So let's look at our two assets. Remember, we have land one and land two. Land one went down in value. Land two went up in value. So we're talking about the asset that's appreciating. That's this asset right here, the 90 to the 120. But specifically, we're only limited with respect to the 45 and 60 because we're only limited to one half because um, grape is only receiving one half of the asset, not the full asset. So that difference, right, that difference of 15 is what we're limited to with that rule. So what I'm saying is that land number two has an adjusted basis of 90. Remember, we're getting one half, so that's 45, right? Adjusted basis equals 45. Fair market value is 120, but remember, we're getting half, so 60. So what we do is, because this asset is going, is gone up in value, right? And then, again, assume you purchased it three years ago for this, this, for this analysis. You purchased it three years ago for, um, for $90, and now it's worth 120. It's gone up in value. So what we do is we take the fair market value minus the adjusted basis. Fair market value is 60, right? The fair market value is the one half, one half portion, minus the adjusted basis, which here is 45. That gives us 15. So this first 25, 15 of it, increases the appreciated asset, which is land two. Now land one has depreciated, so we don't allocate anything there. Then the second part, the remaining 10, will be allocated based on relative fair market value. And I'm going to show you how to do that. So again, this first 15 goes to land two. So right there, we know it's going to increase land two's adjusted basis. So land two's basis will go up by that, and we'll do the end calculation later. The, so that's the first step. The second step is that the remaining amount, the remaining 10 here, 10 left over, right? Remember, we have 25 total. So the remaining 10 is allocated based on relative fair market value of what grape is getting. Grape is getting one half of land one, one half of land two. Land one, one half is 60. Land two, one half is 60. So right there, we take land number one, land number two. The fair market value of land one is 60. Land two is also 60. So we add those together. We get 120, so the calculation is 60 over 120. Land 2, 60 over 120. We then multiply that by this 10 that's left over, right? Because the, the 25 total we have to increase by. We're going to get 5 to land 1, 5 to land 2. So step 1, 15, we increase the adjusted basis by 15 of land 2. And then step 2, we increase the adjusted basis of land number one by five, land number two by five. So in our final calculation, putting it all together, we have land one, which remember we start with a basis of 90. So 90 plus, there's nothing from step one, but we have five from step two, so that's 95. And land number two, the adjusted basis we start with is 45. Step one, we increase it by 15. Step two, we increase it by five. And that's going to give us 65. So we go ahead, we put those numbers in our chart, 95. And 65, and again, these numbers will equal the number above because, again, after tier two, in situation E, you had 120 to allocate, right? 75, 45 equals 120. In E1, we had 98, we had 56, 42. Those numbers equal 98. And then E2, we had 160 to allocate left. 95 and 65 equals 160. So that's what you're doing. You're breaking it up. And again, under section 
732, C2, and C3, we apply the rules this way when you have multiple Tier 2 assets. Again, you focus on the first question is, you look at the adjusted basis left. Left after Tier 2, you ask, hey, is the adjusted basis left after Tier 2 to allocate to Tier 3? Is it less than the inside basis of those assets? If it is, you apply the analysis we did in E and E1. But if it's greater, you apply the analysis we did in E2. So the black analysis was our original analysis with a little bit for E, and then the red was we added on for E1, and then the blue was for E2. So all that stuff, very important. Go back over that in your notes. Go back over that. Very, very, very important. All right. Let me switch black to a uh, black font. We're going to finish off this problem. We're going to finish strong. Look at that, man. That was a long, big chunk. Woo! But we're now down to F. In F, one-third of both the inventory and the accounts receivable and $120 cash. So now we're getting cash. Now we go back to a regular basis, by the way, of $170 in, in F, just the original F. So we have $120 cash. So we have our liability relief of $50. That still stays the same for every part. Minus... 120 cash, that brings us down to a zero subtotal. If this was negative, we'd have capital gain, but it's zero. That's not negative. So we have no capital gain, no gain to grape, no gain to the, par no gain to the partnership. Subtotal zero. Now, in addition to getting the $120 cash, grape is getting one-third of both the inventory and one-third of the accounts receivable. This is really easy. If you get to tier two and you have zero, then both assets are going to get zero. Because remember, the rule is you're limited to the lesser of the adjusted basis that the partnership has in the asset, which is um, zero for accounts receivable, right? Zero times it's one third of accounts receivable. Zero times one third is zero. Inventory is 30 times one, one third, which is 10. But the lesser of 10 and zero is zero. So both assets get a zero basis. Both the accounts receivable and inventory both get a zero basis. We have zero left. There's no tier three assets. And the rule is, hey, if you have any basis left after tier two, but there's no tier three, then you have a capital loss. But we don't have any basis left. It's zero. So therefore, we're done with the problem. There's no gain or loss. And Grape takes a basis in accounts receivable and inventory of zero. Okay, now we go to F1. In F1, same exact situation as F, right? One third of inventory, one third of accounts receivable, and 120 cash. Except we're changing up the basis. What if Gushing Grape's basis was $100? So now I have a $100 basis. We've got 50 of liability relief minus 120 of cash received because we're still in F. That brings us to negative 70. Uh oh, we have a negative. First time we've seen this. So under section 731, remember that's our gain or loss rule. If this number is negative, this is the only time you can have gain when you have a pro rata distribution to a partner receiving a distribution. So we have to record 70 of capital gain, that's going to bring our subtotal to zero. And just like an F, right, we're receiving one third of inventory, one third of accounts receivable, but the lesser of rule. So it's going to be zero allocated accounts receivable, zero to inventory, again, because it's the lesser of zero or zero or positive number. So of course it's zero. And then we go down to the subtotal and that's zero and there's nothing to allocate to tier. Well, there's no tier three assets, so there's no capital loss. But the important thing to note is that while the accounts receivable and inventory are zero, just like an F, now in this situation, Gushing Grape has a $70 capital gain. Ooh, capital gain. We haven't seen that one yet. And depending on how long Gushing Grape has held the ownership interest in the LLC, it's either a long-term capital gain or short-term capital gain. It looks like Gushing Grape has probably held the interest for um, quite a few years based on the numbers. So, um, I mean, we don't know exactly, but if you were given an example exam question you'd have to know or if not you'd have to just say okay what's well, long term if it held more than a year short term if a year or less that's what you that's how you would analyze so let's go to f2 in f2 it says what is gushing grapes basis prior distribution if you have a 200 dollars basis so we put 200 here minus 50 right for the liability relief and again in f we're still getting 120 cash so we bring that down we have a 30 basis left okay that's not a negative, so we have no gain recognized by, by uh, Gushing Grape. So we bring down the 30. All right, so we have 30 left. Remember, we go to our rules. So no gain because uh, we have enough basis to cover the Tier 1, the liability relief, and the cash. So we go to Tier 2. 
The rule is, hey, for ordinary income assets like the inventory and accounts receivable, we carry out or limited to the inside basis or the outside basis, whichever is lesser. So let's go do that. So Gushing Grape and F2 is receiving one third of inventory, one third of accounts receivable, and the cash. We already took care of the cash. So let's start with the accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is a zero basis. Zero times one third is zero. So the lesser of zero and 30 is going to be zero. What about the inventory? So inventory is a basis of 30. 30 times one third is 10. So the lesser of 10 and 30 is, of course, 10. So we bring down 30 minus 0 minus 10. We have 20 left over. Okay, we have 20 left, but we're only receiving one third inventory, one third accounts receivable, 120 cash. Guess what? We have no tier three assets, but we have something left. So if it's liquidating and there's no tier three assets, partner has a capital loss for the remaining outside basis. So this $20 left over is a $20 capital loss, again, depending on whether, under Section 731, it's a $20 capital loss, depending on whether the interest is held for more than a year or a year or less, makes a difference whether it's long-term capital loss or short-term capital loss. We're not told in the problem, so if it's more than a year, it'd be long-term capital loss. If a year or less, short-term capital loss. All right, so we have concluded the problem. Please go back over this. There's a lot of stuff here. We started by going through whether this is pro rata or disproportionate. That's where we start. Then we started going through and creating our chart. We've talked about the rules for simple distributions, pro rata distributions, waterfall for simple distributions, going through that. We went through A, B, uh, C, and D. Then we spent a significant time on E, E1, and E2 on what happens if you have um, multiple assets in tier three, and we applied section 732 C2 and C3. We went through that, so go back over that. We used the three different colors, black, red, and blue. Then we went to F, F1, and F2. All that changed in those situations where the bases changed to the top, where we saw situations where you'd have capital gain, capital loss that results. Go back over this. Really great problem. Addresses many, many issues, and I hope to see you in future videos.